Now, welcome to the city of Antwerp, where we gathered today for the Global Linen Business Meet and uh, organized by Horaces. I have with me on my right uh, Frank Richter, the chairman of Horaces, and we have got Jason Ma from US. Uh, he is into education and uh, into development of people in all over Asia and India. Uh, Frank, as you all know, is running this organization for so many years very well. I'm going to ask you a few questions today, which is a little different from the run of things. Since you do, uh, the Horasis does this global Arab meet, the global Chinese meet, the Russian meet, and the Indian meet, we want to look today at the cultural ethos and the cultural connections in the development. So tell me, uh, Frank, first of all, what is your impressions about the impact of the culture of a nation or the psyche of people on the business growth of a country, especially so about India? Thanks, Chairman uh, Sharma. I think there's a um, very strong connection between culture and business. It stems from our education background, our cultural background, where we are born, what kind of food we eat, what kind of people we interact with, and it reflects somehow in the attitude we do our business dealings. Just um, in a way uh, portrayed black and white in Asia with a very long-term approach. In a way, uh, many Asian companies are still run by families, very much uh, an imperial spirit behind. It's long-term oriented. We're not thinking in terms of uh, quarterly reporting, uh, in terms of um, the next uh, uh, few months, but it's all like um, three, four, five, even 10, 20 years. I've been to um, China recently, and I uh, talked about uh, a similar issue, saying what is the difference between the Chinese and the so-called Anglo-Saxon model? The Chinese always say, you know, we, we think long term. When you go to Shanghai, for example, right. there's uh, now a museum on the future. It's not like in the past. In Europe, we have a lot of museums, and it's all like the old stuff inside. Of course, it's nice. You all like it. And a lot of uh, tourists come to see it. But um, they are more future-oriented, long-term oriented. And um, that's, I think, the beauty of culture. I think we're all different. What we see now in these times of globalization is that um, cultures and business styles are blending, blurring. You know, people like Jason, for example, they are born uh, somewhere and studying somewhere else, now uh, working all around the globe. And uh, uh, I think it's a challenge also for us uh, at Horasis to deal with all those different cultures, to understand the spirit, the fundamentals, the roots mm. of culture and the different business dealings. In a way, how to write a contract, what kind of points do we stress. In America, when whatever you do, you have to write um, a 100, 200 pages contract. You have to hire not only one lawyer, but several lawyers. Uh, in China, we still have the golden handshake. And very much so in India, I think, as well. You just trust each other. And it's maybe this Asian, Asian cultural spirit of trusting each other, which makes um, Asian companies so different. Of course, Asian companies now going for IPOs at Wall Street or London, so have to adopt to the, the Anglo-Saxon style. But I see a bit of um, changes now uh, back home, back here in Europe, back in the US, that we adopt a bit more of a long-term approach. We, we learn from the Asians. Absolutely. And at the end, I think um, uh, the truth might be in between. It's uh, you know, a cultural mix, and we will find each other uh, adopting and, and using the best elements from the East and the West. Thank you, Frank. Uh, Jason, uh, coming to you, uh, you would be very well placed to ask this question because you are where you are, being from China and in America. Uh, tell me in the corporate uh, governance issues, do you see any differences which societies or cultures bring purely in how corporates are governed? And do you see any uh, problems with that happening in India or in other places uh, since you have seen that and done that? I would say, um, you know, when a couple of years ago when Enron, MCI, WorldCom crashed, that spawned a couple of uh, rather aggressive U.S. senators that introduced the Sarbanes-Oxley Act. Yeah. And as an American, and also as an Asian in one brain, from the American side, I thought that was atrocious. That was pretty, that was pretty bad. So we from Silicon Valley, we did not really like the fact that all the strings that were brought by Sox, Sarbanes-Oxley Act, that was a little bit overdone in okay. reaction to the wrongs that were done mm -hmm. by a very small fraction mm -hmm. of the uh, large corporate environment, mm -hmm. if you will, right? So, and that has taken away some of the overall international competitive advantage from the American standpoint. Now, fast forward to today, I think it's a very vibrant and healthy 
and exciting um, ph phenomenon that's going on in, in India, in many parts of Asia, where, uh, as one example, I talked to one of my friends on the Forbes list in Malaysia. He says, you know, Jason, I think that eight to nine out of uh, 10 great opportunities one decade from now is going to be in, in Asia. Okay. And I tend to agree with him. Because mm -hmm. as both an Asian and America, you look at the situations in terms of the market opportunities right now, the growth opportunities in Asia, um, and the sensitivity to uh, some need for corporate governance, mm -hmm. but not so not done in ways that are a little bit too Western, if mm -hmm. you will, right? So as for myself, I'm a big believer in combining the best of the East, mm -hmm. of the Asian culture and the discipline mm -hmm. with the American uh, creativity and dynamics okay. and lateral thinking. So Asian culture, uh, your value system, your belief system, mm -hmm. that is totally transcending through your corporate culture as well, including corporate culture. I mean, corporate governance, right? Mm -hmm. So what are Asians, right? You're Indian. Yes. I'm Chinese, mm -hmm. but I'm also American, right? So we talk the same language in terms of family, mm -hmm. education, right. and respect for elderly, Absolutely. isn't it? Absolutely. Right. Very important. But at the same time, you are Indian. You also have a bit of a Western flavor, if you will. Mm -hmm. You don't hold back as much as some of my Eastern uh, Asian colleagues hold back. who tend to be a bit more uh, confusion. Hmm. Confucius, right? So I think uh, in the next decade to come, it's going to be very delicious. I'm looking forward to that. Okay. I tend to be more optimistic, Great. despite certain problems that we have in the world today. By the way, if you trust me, comment, uh, you say, you know, blending the East and the West. Mm -hmm. It's exactly what harassis means. Yeah, uh, because, you know, harassis, um, uh, in, you know, the, the first way means visions in Greek. Yes. But when I um, uh, founded a company, I first adopted the Chinese name. It's O Ya Se. Uh, Horace is oh yes, so in Chinese it basically means connecting the East and the West, okay. right? And and I think that's what you say, you know, no Chase. Really we have to, yeah. in a way, take the best things um, from the West and from the East and, and find a middle way. And uh, I think one to one is usually not two, but it's eleven, right? Because yes. we we grow it up and we do it together. Okay, lovely. Well, one more thing which comes to my mind is that sometimes uh, people get a little worried about the youth of the world, you know, mm. especially sometimes in Europe you find skinheads and lots of gangs and all. And some people start getting worried that maybe the youth is getting a little softer and how will that take place and look at you also deal with a lot of youth. So tell me what is your feeling about firstly about the youth which is coming up very technical savvy but also got little problems. Uh, we are okay with that and how are they going to be trained, how are they going to go out to the mainstream to become productive? Can you say something about that? Yes. You know sometimes mm -hmm. that's, this, that's, that's a core part of my overall dedication, my life dedication, my mission. My mission in life today is to help empower and groom future generations of young global leaders, right? I watch Asia, I watch Europe, I watch the Americas. Um, it makes me sad sometimes to see that, um, you know, being an immigrant Asian like myself to the States, I tend to hold this hungry immigrant mentality. I, I work hard. I try to work smarter and smarter all the time. I believe that there is always room for improvement. Now, I look at uh, some of the youth in parts of Europe. Um, they feel a little bit hopeless. There's uh, things that different constituencies in the ecosystem could work on together. The powerful corporates, mm -hmm. public ones, the private ones, the NGOs. Mm -hmm. Uh, entrepreneurs like uh, Frank and I myself mm -hmm. <clears throat> and just try to keep on evangelizing mm -hmm. and because without drivers without catalysts mm -hmm. without uh, inspirators mm -hmm. it's going to be hard for youth that are still they still have a sense of innocence mm -hmm. okay it's not fully their fault right so like I said it's part of a structural mm -hmm. situation and but I, I'm a strong believer in value systems in belief systems mm -hmm. in skills Okay. the way you think. Because if you think the right way, that will affect your decisions and your behavior and actions. So <coughs> I, 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 I like to be a bit more optimistic. Okay. Uh, coming to the last point, tell me, um, is there a linkage between innovation and research and culture? Because we find that across the world, 
there are countries and the regions of the world where they've been very innovative, a lot of research, a lot of path-breaking areas, and certain countries which seem to follow and do it very well. Mm. So what is the connection in culture and innovation and research? Uh, I'll ask you first, and then you could draw. Right. Um, when, when you look at, I, I talked, of course, I have a lot of CEO friends right, throughout the world, uh, in Asia, in Europe, and all that. And a lot of them still think that the higher education, the top-tier universities in the States, are still top notch because they really encourage, you know, advanced, advanced research, and one reason for that is really to cut to be very cutting edge in creating inventions and discoveries. It's very fresh because without pursuit, you're not going to go anywhere, right? Oh. It, it it gives you bragging rights oh. as well, right? And part of that will become commercialized by corporations into products in the future. In Silicon Valley, we are we're crazy people. We are very innovative. We like to invent new things, we like to disrupt existing industries in the world, light a fire, and create new categories, right? right. So it's done as a sport, and also economically benefit you and me, yeah, sure. on a supply side, on a demand side here. Um, I think one thing that I realize in Asia, in Europe, and around the world, is in Silicon Valley, and a bit in Boston, even in uh, parts of, you know, in many parts of India, in China, many parts of the world right now, there's a lot of mini Silicon Valleys, is that they're more tolerant on, okay. on some short-term failures. You try hard, you make a mistake once or twice. They're not gonna knock you down, right? But in the older days in Asia, in Europe, if you fail one time, yeah. oh, you're disowned, you're or you're, 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 you're a failure, failure, right? But in Silicon Valley, actually, we expect you to talk about your failures. What have you learned about that? How, has you, how have you become a better person? Mm. How have you become more effective, more efficient? It's a good thing. Absolutely. Right? Yeah. So that's part of the ingredients that you need in the system. Yeah, Frank, your views on innovation and cultural? You know, thing. innovation, I think, can't be ordered from the top. There are many, um, you know, Silicon Valley type of models um, in use around the world where, like, a state is putting millions of dollars into infrastructure. Take, for example, Skolkovo uh, in Moscow, in Russia. And uh, I think uh, it doesn't work like that. Uh, what you need are the right people. What you need are the innovators. And right. you have to attract talent from around the world uh, to stay there, and uh, not necessarily Russians, Chinese, Indians, but people from all around the world who will meet, uh, join hands, and join the innovate. So it's a bit the, the secret of um, Silicon Valley, a lot of migrants going there. Right. And there, I think it doesn't really matter where you're from. You meet uh, in a pub, you have an idea, and you start, right? And it's this culture of tolerance, as you mentioned before. Right which can't be ordered from the top. But still, I believe um, our leadership, um, our governments have a role to play. They have to inspire people. They have to be a role model. They have to say that entrepreneurship is the best thing in the world. Mm -hmm. They have to really um, go to the schools and even educate the young people, say, be an entrepreneur uh, and don't work for the state or for a large company. Be an entrepreneur. And I think that's the duty of our leaders, to tell the young people that entrepreneurship is the right thing to do. Frank, thank you very much for your lovely comments, and we look forward to your contribution tomorrow in Vasis as you go to it. And Jason, you too. I hope you're looking forward to the meet tomorrow. Thank you. Look forward to that. Thank you. Thank you.